Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be solving a very very interesting functional equation. We have a function f that satisfies the given equation which is f of f of x equals x. In other words, if you compose f with itself, you get the identity function. Are there functions that satisfy this equation? So we're going to go ahead and explore that and I'm also going to show you a really cool way to come up with more solutions, more interesting functions. Okay, if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, when you have a problem like this, you're probably thinking, I could write this as f composition f of x equals x. So these two f's kind of cancel each other out. So doesn't this mean f inverse is equal to f? So we're looking for a function whose inverse equals itself. Well, yes, and this is kind of helpful because I can kind of think about it, it's a little better than f of f of x because composing a function with itself is kind of hard. If you think it's not, then try this on the following function, okay? And I just picked easy numbers for you. So try to compose f by itself and you'll see it's really complicated. Oh, it's just time consuming, it's not complicated. Calculators can do it for you. All right, this is kind of like a Wolfram Alpha or maybe, I don't know, some type of machine learning or AI type of thing because it's just mundane task, nothing critical, right? So how do we find a function whose inverse equals itself? That's a good question. And why don't we start with the identity function? Because identity, the inverse, if you think about rings and groups and other structures in abstract algebra, there's one thing that is significant in operations. There's something called an identity element, right? When you multiply, let's just say our operation is called multiplication, not necessarily the regular multiplication, but general, like the ring multiplication. You multiply any x by identity, you get x from either side, right? What happens if you multiply identity by itself? You get identity because identity acts on itself the same way. You get it? So when you get f of f equals f again, that's kind of like, okay, the identity function satisfies, of course. That's our most obvious, most trivial solution. f of x equals x works, right? Because if you compose the f of x with itself, you get x again. Okay, does any linear function work? Like how about adding something to x, like x plus one, or maybe something like x minus one. Uh-oh, these don't work because what happens is if you keep adding ones, you're gonna be adding twos at some point, right? So that's not gonna work. We kind of need something that will bring us back to x. So, aha, uh -huh. this kind of tells me the following. Now look at it this way. I'm gonna show you an approach to spot easy solutions. By the way, these are called involutions. I think in a previous video, I said something like inverses. I don't know, I don't even remember what I said, but the correct word is involution. Did I say that right? Hopefully. Okay, some grammar police can hopefully confirm that. Now, what was I gonna say? I've lost my train of thought and the train came back. So y equals x, yes, Repla replace f of x with y. And now I'm gonna show you why this works. Like I'm not talking about the variable y, by the way, no pun intended. This works because x and y are completely interchangeable. What do I mean by that? Well, if you just write another equation like x plus y is equal to three, is x and y completely interchangeable? Yes. And so if you write y as three minus x and replace y with f of x, is this function an involution? And the answer is yes. What happens if I replace three with another number or any constant? And the answer is yes again. It's awesome because the interchangeability of x and y allows us to do it. You get the idea? Well, x and y do not have to be interchangeable like that, right? Can they be like this? Well, sure, under certain conditions, because we gotta be very careful about the domain, right? There's something that I'm gonna show you graphically that will confirm this, but this will work in some, uh, under some circumstances. What happens is you can write y in two ways. And with the second one, we may have a problem. But if you consider this, this is a circle originally, right? But if you only consider the top half, and only consider that from zero to one, 
That'll be just awesome. You know why? Because draw the line y equals x. All the points on the graph are going to be symmetrical. That's what you're looking for. Symmetry ac across y equals x. That's what an involution is. So that's why this is going to work from 0 to 1. I don't know if 0 or 1 are included, but I guess you could include them if you wanted to. So in general, f of x equals c minus x is a solution. And for the same reason, would this work? Why not? It, it does because x and y are interchangeable and we don't even have that domain problem. So from here, if you solve for y, you're going to get something like this, which is super duper cool because think about it. You define a function like a cube root of something and its inverse is the same thing. How cool is that, right? It's an other involution. But the question is, how many solutions are there? If f of x is a solution, can negative x be a solution as well? Absolutely. Because remember, c minus x is a solution. If c is 0, you get f of x equals negative x, which means take the x, negate it, and negate it again, you get x back. You get the idea? Okay. And for that reason, y equals 1 over x works because xy equals 1. Again, x and y are completely, completely, completely interchangeable. You get the idea? But of course, interchangeability is not always this obvious. Sometimes it's super duper complicated. How about something like this, right? Is x and y completely interchangeable? And is this a function, by the way, right? There are two variables. So anyway, solving for y will give you something really cool. Actually, you can solve it using the cubic formula, but trust me, it's going to be painful, but rewarding at the end. you got to wait until the end. Okay, cool. So those are some of the ideas, and here's the coolest part. Okay, if you're still around, watch this. So we can take an involution, suppose g is an involution, and I'm gonna give you an example. And then we're just gonna take a bijective function so that it can be inverted easily, right? Not easily, but just inverted, right? Uh, so take a bijection h, h is a bijection. I hope that you know what that means, one to one, and uh, what's the other one? I forgot, onto, something like that. So objective. And then uh, we're gonna form a really weird function. We're gonna sandwich g between h and h inverse. You get it? Something like this. Uh-oh, that's really crazy, right? The composition of inverse with g and then h. But remember, g is an involution, so g composition g is identity. Let's call that i, which means i of x is x. i is identity function, okay? Cool. Now, with this notation, is something cool about this notation is that you don't use inputs like x's, so it's kind of faster. Now, why is this an involution? Again, right? Let's go ahead and prove that first. Okay, we're doing a proof here. Be careful. Now, we can take this, and if this is an involution, its inverse should equal itself or its composition. Let's call this f. f of f should be the identity. Is it true? Let's find out. Best way to find out is just by composing these two functions. I mean, uh, this function by itself. And now, from the associativity property, we can actually get rid of all the parentheses. You don't really need them. And now you get the following. These two are inverses, right? Obviously. And they're invertible because uh, h is a bijection. They cancel out, sort of. I know some bigger people will be like, no, you can't do that. Yes, we can, loosely. And then g, composition g is... Um, because g is an involution, it's an identity again, they cancel out, and h inverse and h, uh-oh, they cancel out again, giving us the identity, which means the composition of f by itself, with itself, is identity, which means this is an involution. Have we made an involution, or revolution maybe, who knows? Okay, great, let me give you an example. So suppose g of x is equal to x plus 1 over x minus 1, and let's just say h is e to the power x. Okay, now remember, this needs to be, the first function needs to be an involution, it is, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. And the second one needs to be bijective, and it is. Now let's go ahead and form this. What is this? Okay, so we're going to compose e to the x with this, and that with this, again, right? So remember how composition, oh, by the way, oops, uh, if h is this, h, oops, h inverse, if h is e to the x, h inverse should be ln x, sorry about that, 
So I'm supposed to replace e to the x with ln x. I just realized, uh oh, this doesn't work. And we can do in any order because of the associativity. Let's do these first. It's always good to work from right to left. And now you're gonna replace x with e to the x that you always do from right to left. Uh, e to the x plus one over e to the x minus one. That's the composition of these two. And if you compose that with ln x, you can replace this with x. It's gonna be ln e to the x plus one over e to the x minus one. And let's call that f of x and guess what? This is gonna be an involution, but that's for you to check. Let me go ahead and quickly tell you why x plus one over x minus one works. Actually, it does work because look at these two coefficients. In general, if you take f of x equals ax plus b over cx plus d and do the f of f of x, and then let me tell you what that's gonna give you because that's kind of time consuming. And here's what you're gonna get after you do the composition. And then I'll tell you what this is gonna look like because this is really, really cool. Now, ba basically I picked a rational function and I want it to be an involution under which condition it is going to be an involution. Ready? Now, we want this to be X, right? For F to be an involution. So in order for this to be X, this is what needs to happen. First of all, this guy over here needs to disappear so we can get something times x. And then this guy needs to be disappear, disappear, so that I can divide something times x by something. And then those two things have to be equal because like 5x divided by 5 is equal to x. You get the idea? So we get the following system from here. AB plus BD is 0. AC plus CD is 0. And from here, you basically get something like this. D equals negative A. And guess what that means? If F is an involution, then it needs to be in the following form. AX plus B divided by CX minus A. So as long as these are opposites, you are good to go. B and C have no saying in this. But of course, you can divide everything by A and make the coefficient of X1. And then, because I'm about to show you, ta -da -da -da, some results from Wolfram Alpha. And as you can see, we already talked about it. We talked about this. And yes, this was the last thing we talked about. We talked about this, but we didn't. Why does this work? It's really weird, right? There's probably some type of quadratic business. But anyways, this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe. Take care. Don't forget to check out A plus BI, my other channel about complex numbers. And bye-bye.